Good afternoon and welcome back to the Leadership Institute studios. I'm Kyle Bechet, Communications Manager here at the Leadership Institute. Our topic for today is Foundations of Leadership, where we're going to talk about different skills and traits that you should have as a leader and, uh, and what it even means to be a leader. Uh, we are joined today by Joel Gruy, the director of Generation Joshua. Uh, who is here to tell us all about his experience in leadership and what we can do to uh, be good leaders ourselves. However, before we get into today's topic, I would like to remind everybody at home that this is a live broadcast, so you can have your questions answered by emailing us at live at leadershipinstitute.org. And those questions will be sent to us, and we can get them asked for you and have a good discussion about it. Um, but you can also, at home, join our discussion today by using the hashtag LIWebinar. Um, and you can make comments and, and questions, and we'll answer them here on the show. With that, Joel, thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much, Kyle. I really appreciate it. Yeah. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Well, so what is leadership? Huh. Uh, that is the billion dollar question. Yeah. Is it not on? I apologize. Should be. Did they not? Let's try it again. <laughs> we'll try that one more time. Sorry. So yeah, what is leadership? Well, apparently it's having your mic on at least. But at the, <laughs> at the minimum, uh, leadership, in a sense, it's the million dollar question. Uh, what is leadership? People talk about it. There's huge industries uh, come entirely dedicated to it. There's books and authors and organizations dedicated to it. And there's a lot of different definitions. Personally, the one I like is actually something that another one of uh, the Leadership Institute's teachers gave me. And that is the art of bringing people along with you. Because there's an element to it being an art form. There's also an element to it being skills that you can train and mature. And if you're interested in being a leader or you're training leaders, which is what I do, uh, having a functional definition, understanding the complexities of it is important. Now, practically, um, leadership does change a little bit depending on the venue you're in, of course. Uh, for us, I, I'm usually working with teenagers. And we, uh, Generation Joshua, which is what I'm the director of, we are mm -hmm. looking to train leaders uh, for, uh, in our country. And they range from all walks of life, all different aspects. So when we talk about leadership in what we do, particularly when it comes to the conservative movement, we're talking about the different um, political aspects of it, but also the social and maybe civic elements. We want to make sure that the definition we're using, in this case, the art of bringing people along with you, is something that fits for all of the different aspects of our, of our culture. It varies. Um, leadership, however, practically is, is broken down into two large pieces. There are the skills you need for leadership, of which there's a variety of, of skills. That, and these are things you can learn and be trained in. I and mean, this is stuff that, that we teach, of course, at Generation Joshua, that the Leadership Institute teaches. A lot of organizations are dedicated to it. Um, and these, it can range from everything from good time management skills um, to, to budgeting to a variety of things that are useful for actually organizing people. Mm -hmm. There's also, of course, the character. Mm -hmm. That's a little different. Uh, those things, of course, you can learn. People develop and mature in their character as, as they grow older. At least that's the theory. And my parents all hope that we manage <laughs> to do. Um, but practically, those things are, tend to be a little more innate. Um, it also is something that is harder for us to evaluate. I don't know if you're like me in this aspect, but sometimes self-evaluation of knowing what I do well and what I don't do well, uh, not just my skills, but actually my characteristics, what sets me off, what, what keeps me calm, that's a little more difficult. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's having a good understanding of yourself, mm -hmm. of the skills you have, what skills you can learn, and what uh, uh, the, the kind of character building stuff that you sure, can also sure. bring, bring together. So it's not something that you just are born with. Like no. a lot of people assume leaders are just born. There's the argument for the natural born leader. Mm -hmm. Someone who's just born and they are, ta-da, I am yeah. the leader. There are some people that have an inherent level of char charisma that will, that can dominate a discussion or a conversation or even an area. But even for most of those people, there's a lot of technical skill and training and, and work that has gone into that to make that person what they are. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the idea of a natural born leader, some people just born to it, is largely a myth. Mm -hmm. um, we see historically people that are in no way someone I would say is qualified to be a leader who rise to great positions of leadership or are, have that thrust on them often and, and thrive in that. Not because it's genetics, because it's not. Uh, this leadership is something that can be trained um, and something that can be built in people. Now, there, is, there are people that have kind of natural talents. Um, if I'm particularly dexterous with my, with my fingers, mm -hmm. I might be better at playing piano than someone who isn't. But at most, it's an inherent base, and it gives me, someone maybe a slight advantage mm -hmm. at most. 
So, so but uh, you ever, all of us are born with a certain set of strengths and sure, things that we're sure. good at and the way we think and things like that. So all of that can be turned into some kind of a leader. Well, I would actually argue that every person in some aspect is a leader. Mm -hmm. If the idea is that as leaders, we are moving people in a direction with us. At any point where you're put in a position where you're not making the decisions, you're leading. Mm -hmm. You may not recognize it. In fact, most of us would run from the fact if we realized that we were technically being the leader, but often we are. Mm -hmm. um, my wife, for example, is someone who would very much not view herself as the commanding presence. Yet she keeps finding herself in leadership and can't figure out why. It's because she can make decisions. Mm -hmm. She's good at it, better than I am sometimes. Which is, mm -hmm. But she married me. So anyway, but nonetheless, she, um, <laughs> I'm very grateful for a moment of what I would occasionally consider a bad decision on her part, but a very good one for me. Um, nonetheless, she often finds she herself. today? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> she was she was promoting it on Facebook earlier, so we'll see how that well, goes. Your phone's not going off. So no, at it's least well, we're good. <laughs> I turned it off for a reason. Um, but she she ends up finding herself often in places where she's with a group of people, I mean, and this could be a small thing. It's a group of friends, and it can be everything from figuring out where we're going out to dinner to what are we doing tomorrow for the education of our, our kids. She helps lead a co-op there. They have the rain is coming in, so what do you do now when the when the day gets changed? All of a sudden, leadership happens. Mm -hmm. It's like here's what we're doing. Here's the new plan. We're making decisions. We're going forward, and they're trying to do it in a way that moves people along with them. You're not leaving someone behind. You're not rolling over the top of someone's emotions. You're taking those into account. She does that. She's very good at it. Mm -hmm. She's not terribly comfortable at it, but frankly. Most people aren't comfortable in leadership to start with. In fact, it takes practice and doing it more and more, and she's a lot better this year than she was last year, and so on and so forth. Back. I, myself, was not the person that felt very comfortable leading. I wanted to lead growing up, but when it actually got to the moment, it's taken a lot of practice to get even the rudimentary aspects mm -hmm. of this. That's hard. But it's worth it, and we all do it. So if you're going to learn leadership, what you're doing is enhancing a skill that, frankly, every single person uses in some aspect. I don't mm -hmm. care if it's in your neighborhood, if it's in your right. community. Maybe it's at your local city council. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're a senator. Yeah. I mean, one of the ideas that we talk about here at the Leadership Institute a lot is you know, leading without authority, which is you might not be you know, somebody with people under you that yeah. you order around all day, but you might be the person that gets ordered around, but you can still have leadership sure. potential with sure. some of the things that you say and how you, you mm -hmm. act in your role. There's a difference between leadership and command. Mm -hmm. okay. Command authority means I can order you to do it. Yeah. And people often think of leadership as you know, the colonel in the army or something. They can order people and people do it. That is true. Okay. But sometimes they will do it even if they think that the colonel is a jerk. Mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing happens sometimes. Leadership is where they're doing it because they are following you. And they want to, not just because if they don't, they're punished mm -hmm. um, or they're obligated to. Now, there is some element of leadership and command, but it's a broader right. pool than that. Right. Now, when we talk about leadership with, with the young men and women that I train, uh, one of the things we talk about a fair bit, uh, again, the skills and the character necessary. There's, there's five big aspects of each if I was going to go through them. For the skills, jumping over that, and this is something that pretty much anyone can learn, um, I would say the first one is prioritization. Okay? If you're going to be a leader, know what needs to be done in what order. Mm -hmm. I have a thousand things, probably literally, on my <laughs> desk right now, of things people want to do or right. want me to do. Mm -hmm. And I have different people, some above me, some below me, all yelling for their thing to have attention. Right. And I am being forced to make choices regularly as to which ones are the most important things. And on occasion, that means I disappoint someone. But <laughs> if I don't have a good choice of prioritization, mm -hmm. I'm not going to know which thing to do in what order. Right. And often at the end of it, you either get gridlock because you can't make a decision or the wrong things get done. Okay. It's, this is a basic thing. You can evaluate what's the most important thing. People do that, and we can train people to do that. But it's something to consider. If you don't actually consider that in your decision-making metric, you're going to mm -hmm. often go wrong. Yeah. So learning that process and thinking it through, very helpful. Uh, the next one is a very obvious aspect of leadership. It's communication. You guys spend huge amounts of time teaching communication here at the Leadership Institute. And you're excellent at it. I've mm -hmm. gotten to meet some of your trainers, and I have been blown away with their quality every time. They're amazing. Uh, frankly, far better than I am. <laughs> but they are all working under the understanding that we are going to lead people and one of the most core components of leadership is communication. Because if people don't know what you're doing or what you want them to do, they're not going to do it. Imagine that. Um, and it doesn't have to be verbal, I'm standing mm -hmm. up and giving a speech or writing a letter or preaching a sermon or whatever the thing happens to be. It doesn't have to be necessarily verbal communication. Sometimes it's body language. Sometimes it's art. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is just positioning. Sometimes it's uh, social media. There's a dozen ways communication happens. It doesn't have to be verbal. Mm -hmm. But if you don't understand how you're communicating, in fact, if you're a verbal communicator, understand the other aspects because if you don't know those, 
you can sink yourself on the way through sometimes. Yeah. Um, you can't communicate your message. In fact, you can make a good case, and when I talk about this, I have a class I teach on this with a lot of the students. One of the things they mentioned several times, if you want to talk about people that are leaders in culture, um, you'll often get a bunch of entertainers and, and mm -hmm. uh, um, sports, mm -hmm. sports figures. They influence people. They move people in different directions. Justin Bieber may not have a lot of good qualities about him, but he can definitely get people to buy his stuff. Okay? <laughs> there is some aspect of leadership happening here, whether we like it or not. Okay? <laughs> and this happens across the board. They have communicated something. In this case, what they've communicated mm. is themselves, right. and people want that. Okay? Again, it can be learned. Uh, moving down there, coalition building. If you can communicate to people with a vision, uh, the goal of that communication, of course, is to bring them on board. Mm -hmm. okay? uh, for the conservative movement with LI, you're trying to bring people into the team. Mm -hmm. uh, what, is, what is Morton's phrase? Uh, give them a title and get them involved, I Correct. believe is, yeah. is how the law works. It's <laughs> true, okay? Give them a title, get them involved, and we're building a coalition. We're building an alliance and a grand mm -hmm. team. A leader will do that in every aspect. Very rarely is the leader looking for a minimal team. Okay? That works well in movies, Hollywood, you know, the Navy SEALs. But we aren't mostly like that. As a rule, <laughs> what we're actually trying to do is do something with a large volume of people, because most of us can't dedicate an entire life or two to a very small, highly elite team. That's not to say you don't surround yourself with some good people. Of course you do. But as a rule, we're building for size as well as for depth. Um, to move down, delegation. Okay. This, of course, is another aspect of leadership. At a certain point, like I mentioned, that thousand things on my desk, the email that's pouring through your system right now, et cetera, uh, what do you do with all of it? We can't actually do all the things people ask us to do. I, I will die if I try. I've learned this because I've tried. <laughs> a lot of these lessons, by the way, I learned from personal mm. failures more right. than it is for anything beyond that. So if we have a, a variety of things impacting us, we have to learn what stuff we can hand off. What are the things I need to be involved in? What are the things where I can pass it down? Mm -hmm. okay. An aspect of that has to be trust, too. Because it's not easy just to pass. It's Like you mentioned, it's not easy just to pass off something and, sure. and just let it. In fact, it's terrifying. Yeah. To be very fair, it is terrifying. What's the you know, if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. I mean, that right. is almost a core component of American ideology at this point. <laughs> that the only person who can do it right is me. Yeah, and that doesn't matter who's saying it. It's it's just me. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's even that aspect. It's like we were talking um, earlier today. I had a conversation with some um, friends of mine about over, over lunch even, and we were talking about leadership, and we were talking about the current presidential mm -hmm. election, and the question of trust came up. Yeah, who do you trust? That got an interesting reaction from a bunch of different perspectives. And they said, well, it'd be so much easier if we just had someone in charge. They just, there wasn't this question of having to evaluate trust every time they, just, they were in charge. I said, well, unless it was me, because I don't trust any of you, yeah. and I could be the new monarch, this is going to end badly. It doesn't work. And they all smiled and laughed right. about it, because each one of them thought they should, of course, be right. the monarch. It doesn't work that way. What was the quote? An authority uh, totalitarian regime's great if I'm the one in charge. Yeah, something it, that's like that. very true. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly if I'm the one in charge, not you, but me. Um, and, and we talk about this all the time. Um, it's also kind of addictive. Yeah. But there, that's a different matter. Uh, again, going down to delegation, though, it requires trust. Mm -hmm. um, I need to know that when I give you a job, it will be done. It will be done with high quality. It will be done on time. And if not, you'll tell me. You'll be communicating to mm -hmm. me. And that is built. Um, I usually start by giving someone a small task. Mm -hmm. And if, of course, they can succeed at that, they'll get a bigger one. Um, that idea of progressive uh, building of trust mm -hmm. is important. Yeah. Uh, one of the hardest things for me when I started having an intern was trusting that I could just give them a project and, be, and not have to stand over top of them, like, have you done this part yet? And I've done this away, and just let them do it themselves. That was one of the hardest things. I, I, I found a great cure for that. I give you so much work, you don't have time. <laughs> Um, this is what happens to me sometimes. Mm -hmm. I, I, delegation for me was learned by force mm -hmm. because I was going to die if I stood over the person. And at a certain point, I just had to trust them. Yeah. And lo and behold, they, they not only succeeded, they succeeded far beyond what I expected. I have a variety of staff, mm -hmm. all of which are excellent at what they do. And nine times out of ten, not only are they accomplishing what I've asked them to do, but they've done it in a far better way than I considered. And I've learned that I can rely on their skills. Now, the person has to be trustworthy. They have to be dedicated and, and invested in what they're doing. But when that's there, they're going to succeed and feel valued as you communicate your trust to them by delegating things to them. Do it well, and they will do it well. Um, that makes effective leadership. If you're able to do that and walk away, there is definitely leadership happening here, and that will augment and enhance what you're trying to move. That is a major aspect to it. Last piece, of course, is motivation. A leader's job is to motivate the team. I don't know if you've been in, ever been in a place where the team's there, they have communication, there's delegation, there's all these different pieces, they know what they have to do in order, but they don't care. Mm -hmm. At a certain point, if you don't care, you're going to lose. It's going to end. If we're building a movement and the movement doesn't care, it, we, we are toast. Um, the leader provides that, that 
inspiration, the fire, as it were, for the people that they are leading. And mm -hmm. that's sometimes that's overlooked because you're not producing, it doesn't have an ROI, you don't have, there's not budgets attached to it. What you're doing is you're investing in someone often relationally and encouraging them and inspiring them. And it doesn't look like anything on paper that makes sense to HR. But you know what? When it's done right, the output of that is measurable through the other person and mm -hmm. it is entirely worth it. It just doesn't make sense in a job description but it is utterly crucial to be a leader. And frankly, we're not talking about leaders as a job position or a paid position. We're talking about leadership in any form. Mm -hmm. I mean, I work with homeschoolers a lot. One of the things that moms often have to do is get their kids to be interested in learning. Once they're interested in learning, often students are exquisitely good at learning. Mm -hmm. They just have to care. That is, uh, that is the common challenge in many of the educational models here. Once the students care about the learning, they will learn, but if they don't care, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I can do all the other stuff, but if they don't care about it, it just comes one way or mm -hmm. the other. So making the peop making right. people care about it, that, that will be crucial. And that, and that is both a skill, something of a character quality as well, but that really is something of a skill. That must be one of the hardest things for a leader to figure out because not motivating me probably wouldn't be the same as motivating somebody else. Nope. And, no. and that involves understanding that, yeah. Sure, the people, for example, am I dealing with an extrovert or an introvert? Mm -hmm. okay. The extrovert, they're gonna be motivated by the fact that when this is done, we're gonna to go to this other thing with a bunch of other people, and I really wanna be at that event, so I'm gonna make sure this is done, great. The introvert, it's like, when this is done, you can go have five hours, and I won't bother you until you know, 8 p.m. tonight. Fabulous, I'm gonna go curl <laughs> up under my desk for the next five hours. Totally different things. Um, I, I have one right. of each on my staff, and they are all the way to the extreme, one side <laughs> or the other, and what they need are completely different. And that's just basically giving them what they want, but understanding that person. Um, other people care about different things. Someone might be more artistic than others. Someone might be very policy oriented. Those, so you have to be able to learn the person and dialogue in them. Again, it means you have to be somewhat, somewhat of a student of the people you're leading, either in large groups or in individuals for your senior team. Moving from skills, though, there's another aspect, of course, to leadership, and that's character. Okay? Uh, this, is, this is a big part. Again, with that motivation we talked about, often the leader must demonstrate that they are both driven and passionate about what they care about. Um, if I can motivate you, but you don't think I care about it, it's going to fall flat. Um, but if I genuinely care about what I'm doing and I'm communicating that to you, it inspires me just as much as it inspires you. If I wake up in the morning and I'm looking forward to going into work, which thankfully I get to work in a place where I do. I get up in the morning and I love what I do. I, I, I genuinely do. That, I, I've worked in places where I don't. Um, and there's a clear difference even in the leadership aspect when you are leading in both places, when you love what you're doing when you hate it. When you're dreading walking in the morning, the entire office, the entire team, the entire aspect, whatever it is we're working to, will drag. Mm -hmm. okay. as, a care, as a leader then, it is incumbent on you to make sure that people do care, um, or that you care, because that will flow to other people. And that's hard, but it is important. Um, moving down from that, the other one is courage. One aspect of leadership that frankly isn't terribly fun is to make hard decisions. And the, the worst part of leadership in my view is usually hard decisions because often the reason it's a hard decision is because either someone's going to be unhappy or more likely hurt either way you choose. But you must choose. This happens in foreign policy all the time. We take a lot of our students through foreign policy crisis simulations. It's a great fun. It's almost like living a Tom Clancy novel for a couple days. But those stories are so gripping because they're hard mm -hmm. and there are costs that are being made there. And so if you want to learn how to be a leader, learning how to, how to make those judgments and costs is crucial. And that will require courage. What is, what is the, the John Wayne quote? Courage is being scared and saddling up anyway. Mm. Something to that effect. It, it's like, I know this is going to be really painful and this is really going to hurt and this may not end the way I want to. <laughs> but I need to do something and it's better than not. And that ability to make that action. I mean, I've got a, I've got a, a four-year-old, a six-year-old, and a, a two-year-old right now. Three boys all at home. And it, it's chaos. But at the moment, they're getting to that stage where they have to decide they're going to be cur courageous or not. It's like, I don't want to do that but I'm going to anyway. <laughs> and there's that moment where you watch the parent, that, that choice. Well, that still has to happen with us as adults. We just don't think of it. We only think of that as little kids right. learning how to walk and all the rest of it. But really, you're always going to be faced with those decisions. Um, moving from courage on down, ironically, this is not a common one in, in Washington leadership today or politics. I would argue it's humility. If we want to be an effective leader, and this is particularly true if we're dealing with young, leader, like young leaders and young followers. Okay. When you deal with the youth leadership, which is what my expertise is in, <clears throat> they are craving authentic leaders, which means you have to be willing to admit, I'm sorry, I was wrong. That's not something I like doing. Our pride gets in the way. I mean, we have an ego. We don't want to be looked at as someone who screwed up. Yeah. Of course. 
it, it, it grates against us. Mm -hmm. But often, if you want to build that trust of your team you talked about, being able to go to your team and say, you know what, I made a call here, and it was a stupid call. I, I thought I had my reasons. I still might make it again this way, but it was a dumb thing. I should have listened to you. I'm sorry. You may have humbled yourself to them a little bit, but you've also won their trust. They will look at it and go, okay, he's willing to learn. He's willing to listen to me. I, one of the first decisions I made as a leader involved carting obscenely expensive equipment across you know, 2,000 miles by van. Not the brightest moment I've ever had. Okay? And I thought I had a way. Was, that piece of equipment sat in that van for the next 15 days, never got out, never got used. No one ever saw the thing that I planned on doing <laughs> with it. But at a certain point, I was frustrated and I made a call. When it was done, I had to say, you know what, that was stupid. I'm sorry. It's a small thing. But even the small things matter. And mm -hmm. if you do in the small things, they're willing to tell you before you make the big mistakes. And frankly, I'd rather have, apologize for a few small items so that I don't have to apologize for one <laughs> really big one. Um, but we, we still see those today. And again, helpful. It requires humility. That's a character quality. And it's a rare one, but it's downright helpful. Uh, the next one, obviously, going with that, as far as the building of trust, is integrity. Um, if you're a young leader, people will ask you for a 1,000 things. If you're a leader, people ask you for a 1,000 things. Can they count on you? to do what you said you're going to do. That does not mean you need to give them everything they ask for, but it means if you say you're going to do it, you do it. Mm -hmm. um, this talks about it in the media. For example, if, if you're talking to a journalist and you tell the journalist, I don't know the answer, but I'm going to get you the answer. Get them the answer. Make sure that when you give your word, it is trustworthy. If you say, I'm going to do the thing, do the thing. If I, if I said, I'm not going to do the thing, don't. If you can't keep your word, and this is one of those things that I think young leaders stumble into a lot. We will give ourselves to everything. We will say we will do all the things, and then life happens. Mm -hmm and life's painful. Yeah. And all of a sudden, we can't do all the things. What do we do now? We've literally given our word, we can't keep it. It goes back to that humility saying, I, I said I would, I am sorry I cannot. What can, I do? can I either be released from my commitment or can I make it up to you in some way? Again, take some humility, but it's being honest. And it's mm -hmm. making sure people understand, even if, I, even if I'm human right. and imperfect, I'm going to do my best to be someone that is trustworthy because that matters. If I'm, look, if I'm in a crisis point of whatever, and I need someone, I'm going to a leader to assist me, I'm gonna pick the one that I trust whether they're the most competent person or not, because I know if they say they'll do it, they're gonna do their level best to do it. And that will give you a much higher level of influence than I think most people consider, because they trust you. Last piece is decisive. This relates to being uh, the decision-making ability at a certain point in leadership. These are the moments that make great movies and horrible life stories. Mm -hmm. um, in all of the, the stress, it's like when you know, the three people come in and here's all your problems and I need a decision, I need it now. Make the call, understand you, may not have made the right call, but it's okay. Mm -hmm. And you needed to make a decision, you move on, and just say, you know what, it wasn't the best call, and you learn from it. If you don't learn from it, you're, it's gonna be hard. Um, that ability to make a decision and then sleep at night when you're done, even knowing that you may not have made the right one, uh, will actually let you move forward. Otherwise, you're gonna be bound by your bad decisions every time. Mm -hmm. Um, when you're talking about characters, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to say this is how you kind of learn skills. You sure. can give them a step-by-step -step type thing. Sure. I don't think that exists with character. Maybe it does and maybe I'm wrong and you can correct me, but uh, how is it that you tell people to learn some of these character traits? Oh, it's harder. It's yeah. much harder. It is doable. Right? It is doable. Most people think it can't be done. They think character is just inherent to you. It's one way or the other. Yeah. And you're stuck with whatever hand you were dealt. That's not true. People change. Not everyone was always honest, or this, or that, or whatever it is. So it's refined over time in small choices. Okay. So for example, um, at Generation Joshua, one of the things we do to teach leadership is we um, run a summer program called iGovern. And yes, it sounds like an Apple product and all the rest of it, but the idea is that an individual is put in a position where they are allowed governance control, which is a terrifying thought. At least until you look at our government today and you say, well, I have a bunch of 14-year-olds and they actually did it better for a week than the current <laughs> program. <laughs> we, have a, we, we simulate federal government. Right. And Hundreds of students come through it every summer, and they are each put in positions where they are put in, in leadership. It's great fun. It's also a way to test your ability on those characters. You'll see what you do well, what you don't do well. Um, I have trouble making decisions. I don't like being put on the gun. I'm not courageous. I need to work on this. These are crucial pieces of building it, but you don't normally build, learn it in a class. You learn it by doing it. And you can do it in a controlled setting like ours. The nice thing about a camp or something, a simulation, is if you screw it up, you haven't really screwed anything up. It's just a camp, right. um, which admittedly is probably a better learning model than on the job, particularly in federal office. Although that's not always how the voters choose. Um, but you, you, you can learn these by practice, as it were, but probably not through a class. Mm -hmm. um, but again, taking small steps of leadership, right. you will learn that. Now, a part of it, the other part of it, and you, you're, we're, we're get, we're, I'm going to cover this later, but frankly, this fits well here. 
you must be at least in some level self-aware. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what you just did well or not, or you don't take the time to think of you later, you've just had a bunch of experience that gave you no net value because you didn't sit down afterwards and go, okay, what worked? Mm -hmm. That worked, that did not. And next time I won't do that, but that reflection mm -hmm. time in our, in our fast paced life, with the smartphones and the emails and the people coming in out of your office and the traffic that never goes the speed limit, that's too slow, you're at least doing 15 over. Um, yeah, you're not ever going to learn. Mm -hmm bad grammar as that is, you're <laughs> never going to learn if you don't stop to think about what you've done. That analytic time, that processing time, and, and guys, we don't like analyzing ourselves sometimes, but it's crucial. Um, if we don't do that, we're not going to actually gain anything from the experience. Experience is a powerful teacher if we're listening to the teacher, and that, te that listening must occur. Mm -hmm. So you're li what you described is basically just putting people in scenarios, letting them experience it. So when it happens, maybe in real life, or maybe it happens the second time in real life, you know how to handle those yes. situations. Practice. And that builds your courage or your humility, your integrity, and yes. things like that. Yes. So yeah, practice pra makes perfect. Practice makes perfect. And start in small mm -hmm. things before you get to big right. things. Jumping off, the cliff, you know, jumping off the Olympic high dive mm -hmm. is probably not where you start if you're right. four. Okay. <laughs> Maybe the kitty end of the pool would be a better opening for that. Okay. Maybe learning to swim would be the best. That'd be great. Okay. As having a four-year-old who's learning to swim and would take a dive off the high dive, but is terrified of the small end of the pool. I have to convince him he needs to get in the shallow end first. Uh, diving off the high dive is a really bad idea. Yeah. So start small and understand you're going to build yourself that way. Mm -hmm. If it means you're involved in, um, if you're politically interested, of course, if it means you're involved in local politics, get involved in your local party. Get involved in a county committee. Get involved in... Um, a local issues group or issues advocacy. I mean, you know, maybe testify at your city mm -hmm. council. Small stuff, right? Little bits, and you 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 learn from that. You take the time to process it afterwards, and then you try something a little bigger. Mm -hmm. And eventually, someone's going to go. Could you please lead this thing? Mm -hmm. One of our one of Generation Joshua's graduates is um, a gentleman by the name of Timothy Wesco. Okay, he is actually Representative Wesco now. He is, and we've only been around for ten years, and he is currently, or at least uh, until recently, was the youngest serving representative in the Indiana State House. Um, he got involved in politics on a very local level, initially in one of our local clubs, you know, five people in a small town. And eventually, as he got more and more involved, people asked him to start leading, till eventually he was asked to run, he was solicited to run for office by the local leadership, not because he'd sought it, but because someone said, that person has potential. I, I wanna, and often what you'll find is, as you're trying to refine yourself, you'll get dragged upward a lot faster than you feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. But I'd rather have someone else say you should do it than think, aha, I am ready. Um, that, uh, what's the quote from uh, C.S. Lewis? Uh, they, they, at the end of uh, the, uh, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, they ask the, uh, the four children if they're ready to be, be crowned kings mm -hmm. and queens. And I think one of the girls is like, I'm terrified. I, I don't remember the exact part of it. And it's like, if you'd said you were ready, you would not have been. But mm -hmm. the fact that you said you weren't, that means you'll probably be fine. There's some truth to that. Um, and I think that also helps in the practice and preparation of it. Mm -hmm. Before we go on, I just sure. want to quickly remind our viewers at home that they can still send their questions in and we can get them answered. Sure. Uh, and you do that by emailing at live at leadershipinstitute.org and you can send them in uh, even on Twitter by using the hashtag LIWebinar. Okay. So with that, we'll get back to you. Alrighty, your... very good. Now, we talked about this a little bit, yeah. self-evaluation. How do you rate? Okay. A leader should know their strengths and their weaknesses. Now, in our culture today, it's great fun to know your strengths. We like to brag about it, mm -hmm. we do our analysis of it, it goes on my resume. In fact, we, have an enti we are entirely conditioned to make sure we understand what is absolutely best about ourselves and put it right out forward. Okay? That's what we do, that's how we get jobs, for example. These are great things. Okay? That's, that's how we get spouses sometimes. <laughs> you know, these, these are not bad, but if you don't have the other side of that, of knowing both my strengths and my weaknesses, mm -hmm. you're, going to have, you're going to have blind spots. Um, when I build a team around myself, we do, we do summer camps, for example, we're going to build a leadership team to make this sort of events happen. Any other program will have teams, okay? And there'll be a leader and people that are key stakeholders in the operation. They're, they're filling in the different pieces around them, which is wonderful, you have to have that. The people that go into those stakeholder positions, however, often should be considered to be people who have strengths different than your own as a leader, okay? What, in fact, their strengths should be areas that you would see as a weakness of yours, at least in some aspect. Now, you want some overlap, but you also want some, some distinct separation. Because, for example, I know that I'm not the best person at doing internal decor. Like, I have some artistic senses, 
But I couldn't tell mauve from puce from you know whatever the other colors I don't are. I don't know what those words mean. I heard their colors. It was in Monsters Inc. We're gonna leave it there. Um, I don't know, but I do know that they are used for internal decoration. Um, I go with blue and red and green. Like these are very simple primary colors, and that's all I work with. The Crayola crayon box. Yeah, yeah. The yeah well, colors. the small one, yeah. not the big one. The yeah, big one is where we much. have it. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> okay, so when we're doing events, I'm going to find someone else on my team that understands that process is do that part. Mm -hmm. okay. Why? Because I've got a weakness here. <laughs> and you most certainly do not. You know what all those colors are. I have no idea. You have a sense of artistry for that aspect. It may mean that this person has a far better grasp of numbers and spreadsheets. One of my guys is an extraordinary guy when it comes to numbers, accounting, um, budgets and spreadsheets and finances. Fabulous. I can do the big stuff. I, mean, I, I, I headed toward politics because I was told you didn't need math. Um, I mean, have you looked at the federal budget recently? Obviously, they don't use it. So it's very simple. You don't have to, you just, what is it, print more? I'm joking. Obviously, that's a bad idea. But in theory, that's not what it's required. But you know what? You do need those people. You need, and this can happen both in the skills element, as mm -hmm. we mentioned earlier, and the character. So if you are someone who is not naturally terribly humble, and you get someone else who has the courage to tell you that you are going over the top and to walk you back down, that will save you a lot of pain. Now, that means you have to listen to the people. Mm -hmm. that, that's the kicker. If you have asked someone to help you, and then you don't listen to them at all, you've just shot yourself in the foot. Mm -hmm. So that self-awareness process comes in. I know I have issues here. I know I'm good at these. Fill in my strengths. Uh, enhance my strengths. Fill in my weaknesses. Mm -hmm. um, that's crucial. Um, listen to the people. It, it's kind of a balancing act to fill out your team. Um, and even once you've built that team, periodically taking time to reflect on how you're doing, mm -hmm. personally, as well as an organization, very helpful. Um, one of the things that we, I found, particularly for young leaders, we work with a lot less confidence, self-confidence, than a lot of the people I think that, are, um, that have been doing this for a long time. They, 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 they know it, they have a good sense of their own balance. I think for young leaders in particular, if you're just starting out, you're gonna need that concentra concentrated evaluation time where you can say, I'm doing this well, I'm doing this not. Don't get discouraged when you find the stuff you're not doing well, you are not expected to be perfect. You might expect yourself to be perfect. It's a false expectation. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it, that's, that's usually where the trouble lies. Find those places, then work on them. Mm -hmm. okay. how, how do people, I mean, figuring out your weaknesses and admitting them to yourself, that's a very hard thing to do. Yes, I mean, it is sometimes. I, I, nobody likes to know what their imperfections are, and maybe they're not even aware of what they're, like, you know, sure, like having good sure. self work. How, how do you go about figuring that out? Couple things. Um, I found there's three different techniques that I will use to figure that out. Um, one of them is I will ask the people that are kind of within my closest circle, mm -hmm. um, sometimes in the area I'm leading in, sometimes not in that area, but people who know me. Mm -hmm. What are my big three strengths? What are my weaknesses? Getting group evaluation from other people, and not in a way that I'm saying that you're, an, you know, you're a failure in life. They're, they're probably right. not gonna tell you that, particularly if they're your friends. But, but for your friends, in a way like, they'll be how can I improve? Sure, sure, that, that's one of them. Uh, the next one, um, and this one I've, I've always found is, is fun. I will occasionally brainstorm with a few people. I'll take uh, several whiteboards and fill them with every single possible skill and character quality that I've got. Or that I don't have. Anything mm -hmm. I can conceive of in both categories. And there's usually three or four hundred items when it's all done. Now I've saved it so I don't have to do make it every time now. But <laughs> um, then I'll ask someone else, you know, what are my five best? Not saying I can't do this, what are my five best? What are my five worst? And same thing with the skills, same thing with the character, and there's that interactive process. And other times, I'll help someone else evaluate them, and then I'll ask them to turn their favor. And so where you're working, it's not as scary I found when I'm doing it in partnership. Um, you help me, I'll help you, we're working together, we're both going up. If it's just, what I found is most terrifying is when it's some very wise older gentleman who comes in and explains all of the things that you are failing in. Frankly, they probably aren't going to do that, but we're terrified they will. Mm -hmm. um, Usually, if you find someone say, hey, I want to improve, what can I work on? They are usually going to be very gracious to tell you those things in a very kind way, as a rule. Um, I, I, of course, met a few people that would never, ever, I would never ask. But if you trust them enough to want to learn from them, ask them. Uh, there are a lot of people I've met, particularly some, some older folks, who would love to take young leaders and essentially mentor them, mm -hmm. uh, to teach them what they've learned and to prevent them from tripping and falling. Mm -hmm. But that usually happens in a relationship. It's not going to be you know walking down the street, random yeah. person, someone you've known for five, ten years. Ask them. Mm -hmm. It's no, it is no, it is no failure on your part to know where you're weak. Mm -hmm. um, but we're conditioned to not believe that. But trust me when yeah. I say that it's very much a fact that knowing your weaknesses. What is Sun Tzu? You know, you need to know both your enemy's strengths and their weaknesses, your strengths and your weaknesses. If you don't do that, victory is not possible. Right. 
Um, it's not a bad thing. It's a wise thing to have an understanding of that. And so if you want to grow, if a leader is going to be a wise leader, mm -hmm. having that analysis and self-awareness, it's crucial. Mm -hmm. Maybe you say, I'm going to do this once a year, and you take a couple days every yeah. year and do it. That's what I do, and it, it's, very, it's very effective, and I don't have to do it every you know, week or so. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's probably good mm -hmm. for my ego yeah. as well. As I mentioned before the broadcast start, on the side, I umpire baseball. Yeah. And one of the good things, one of the best things we do after the game's over is we don't just get in our car and leave and assume that all is fine. We sit there and we talk, okay, what did we both do wrong? What did we both do right? How sure. can we improve? Sure. And that is absolutely one of like, uh, I don't think I'd be a much better umpire than I was three years ago if that wasn't, of wasn't the case. Yeah. Anytime we do something, and this is something, if you're doing an event, mm -hmm. we, and I, again, I work with events right. a lot, you sit down at the end of it, you have a debrief, is what they call it. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, again, this is something that for a lot of us, we're like, of course you have a debrief. You do that at the end of everything. Well, keep in mind, for a lot of people I'm working with, they've never heard the term. I mean, other than maybe in a legal show. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're saying, okay, what are you going to do now? Now, here's what happened, here's what worked and what didn't. That doesn't have to be hostile. Mm -hmm. If it's becoming hostile, you're doing it wrong. Right. Because theoretically, the purpose of a debrief is for everyone to learn. The people who made the mistakes, and usually you'll find if a mistake was made, there's more than one hand that was in that mess. So usually there's blame to share. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, someone's like, yeah, that was my fault. But as a rule, it's usually done in a group setting, and the group can learn from it. Mm -hmm. And encourage each other for it. So, anyway, there's that. Um, if I can move forward mm -hmm. um, on that, there's, when, we, when we talk about leadership, we have a few different pieces. There's the methods. We talked about that a little bit. Um, and by the way, if there's questions or anything like that, please interrupt. Oh, yeah, it's okay. okay. It's all good. Um, and then, then we talk about trust, because you've brought that up a few times. It's one of the most crucial pieces of it. And it really, it's, it's the big question. Okay. In methods of leadership, there are four major elements of, uh, call it membership. Okay. Or me not membership, ma management, sorry. Wrong thing. Doing a different project this morning, what can I say? Um, that are important to what we do. Um, the first one we mentioned earlier was communication, of course. Um, if you're going to be a leader, how are you going to communicate? Sometimes, it's like Morton. Morton communicates in a written form a lot. His, his essays and letters and extensive text is somewhat legendary within the conservative movement as being very high quality and very long. It's also worth reading, mm -hmm. so don't get me wrong. Read it, I read it. Um, I, I take probably spend more time reading Morton stuff than almost any other because, first of all, it takes more time. But it's also worth it to do, so we do that. Um, so maybe, he's, maybe you're communicating in a written form. Know that and en en enhance that skill. If you're communicating in a spoken form, understand what type of spoken form. Is it a small group discussion? Which is what I'm more comfortable with than something like this. Is it in front of a million people on the mall of America, or, you know, the, the DC mall? Is it on TV? Is it on radio? Some people you should only do it on radio. Some people should are very good on TV. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah, cameras and me, you know, whatever. But <laughs> find those pieces, okay? And when you figure that out, enhance those skills. Because if you know how you're going to be doing it, learn it. If you're an artist and you're going to be communicating via theater or music or something, hone that craft. Okay? Because for the, if we're going to change our culture, if we're going to um, lead our nation. If we're going to shape the conservative movement, um, it means that we're going to have to actually understand how we're talking to people. And it means we're going to be talking to people in different areas. Okay? The conservative movement is not just talking to retirees who care a lot about Social Security. That, that's great. Talk to them. But mm -hmm. talk to the millennials who are caring about the lack of arts in schools. Talk to about the people that are, that are wrestling with STEM education. In, in, in the policy section or the, the lack of STEM education when it comes to jobs. Talk to people about business. Talk to people about the foreign policy elements. You must understand it must be done in, in full aspect. And it means you might be communicating in different ways. If I'm talking to, to well, I don't know, if I'm talking to maybe Gen X, mm -hmm. a certain aspect of it, I'm dealing with something that's going to be more an outdoors group, maybe I'm bringing in someone who's a hunter or a sportsman to have that communication. Or maybe if I'm that sort of a person, I'm talking to them in that context. It might mean that I'm telling stories about hunting adventures with this. I might be telling stories about you know, boating or adventures in the mountains. Okay, fine. Build those connections. Understand that aspect. Learn that lingo. Learn mm -hmm. that language. Make sure you're able to communicate within the context of your audience. Mm -hmm. And knowing your audience sounds really simple and straightforward, but for a lot of us, we have to, we have to do that intentionally. So there's that. Uh, moving down from uh, methods from communication, also the decision-making process, learning how to make a decision. I mean, this sounds basic. Of course, you just make a call. But if you've ever, I don't know, maybe you're not like me, when I'll occasionally ask my wife, where do you want to go to dinner tonight? This is a good hour now. Okay. Then we'll get to dinner. 
um, because there's a debate of where do we want to go and how we make the decision. Do mm -hmm. I want something that's quiet? Do we, are we bringing the kids or not? You know, that matters <laughs> a lot as to where we're going to dinner. Um, and they handle three rambunctious boys. You know, are we? Are you hungry or not? I mean, what do you want to eat? Like, all these questions come in, and so knowing how you're going to make that process, like how you're going to make a decision. Are you doing pros and cons? Are you doing time best estimates? Are you doing, you know, how much of an impact? I mean, whatever that is, and yet, you know, obviously dinner is a much smaller deciding factor, should be a much smaller deciding factor than, you know, um, are we buying a house or the obvious favorite, will you marry me? Though those <laughs> don't have a lot more pieces right. involved. But hopefully. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, if, you, if, if, if marry me and dinner is about the same, <laughs> It's like, go home and rethink your life, okay? There's an element of that. Maybe we found one of the weaknesses. No, there we go, fine, fine. Learn how to make a decision. A lot of people I interact with now are like, okay, how do I make decisions? How do I evaluate things back and forth? There are countless ways and means to do that. But understand you need to know how to do that, so go find it. Great, okay? Um, moving down to uh, methods of leadership, again, another point uh, requires accessibility. Now, this we talked about a little bit, but not much. I want to dwell on it for a second. If I'm the leader in any group or organization, and I have a team of people that I'm leading, at a certain point, they need to be able to talk to me because communication is not just a one-way street. It is not just me with a bullhorn broadcasting. At a certain point, I have to be able to receive the, out, the, the, the pushback. If I'm leading some, if, it's, if what I'm saying is coming across wrongly or flat or off-key, I need to know that. Uh, in fact, it's crucial that I do because I need to be able to correct that before I do more damage. Mm -hmm. It also means that at least some people need to be able to get to me. Um, when, I'm, when I'm teaching leadership, one of the things that I emphasize is the larger the group, uh, the more it's going to be difficult to achieve accessibility. But I also know that, for example, at Leadership Institute, if someone calls and wants to talk to Morton or sends a letter to Morton personally, he's going to see it. He is accessible to the giant host of people that support the Leadership Institute mm -hmm. and your crucial work. Okay? Um, I know for a lot of organizations, that's not that common. But it makes it particularly special for LI, for the conservative mm -hmm. movement, for leaders in general, when people discover they can access you. I, 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 every once in a while, myself, my deputy, et cetera, what we do, occasionally we're like, the phone's ringing and we're walking past and we pick it up. I'm sorry, um, this is, you know, hello, you've reached such and you answer the phone mm -hmm. and they're, everyone's singing, it's, you know, whoever's, you know, answering the phone, an intern or a part-time, whatever. It's like, no, actually it's the director. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, they're swamped. I had a moment, I'll answer the question. And they're utterly, bemused, mm -hmm. but also I found often touched uh, because they've discovered they can access to it. If it means that you know, they're able to get to your personal email, it means you re respond to those phone calls and you take the time to make sure that you're get feeding back to them, not just to your, the members you serve whatever, in whatever form that is, but also uh, to your team itself. If you're just giving orders all the time and you're never willing to be able to take feedback or to listen to how things went, uh, you're going to have a breakdown pretty soon, which comes back to supporting your team if you have a team of people and you're the leader of it, that is both a, an awesome privilege and an awesome responsibility. What, the, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm leading them, which also has an element of I'm caring for them. Um, and I think sometimes we overlook this. If I know one of my staff is going through a hard time, it is my obligation, first of all, to see if I can help in any way, but also to show that relational compassion to that person, to show that I, I care about what they need. It might mean that I know that they are an introvert. And I mean, you know what, you need time alone and I'm going to make something happen in your workflow so you get five hours without anyone touching you. And that'll be good for me and for you. <laughs> um, there's less bad stuff that happens as well. Maybe it means that I know you thrive on interacting with people and I know that you've got tons of other stuff to do, but at the same time, I'm gonna make sure you're attending this event. It might mean that I know, you, I, there was a group I worked with for a long time that they had two ladies that did incredible work with their organization. They were extraordinarily hardworking, they were dedicated, they were the best in class, as it were, for what they did. But they didn't have time to go shopping, the most basic thing they could think of. They didn't have time to get the new clothes they needed for what they're doing, they were pouring so much time into it. So the leader's like, you know what? I can't let you go shopping because frankly, I need you to do what you're doing and you're really good at it. So they hired them a pair of personal shoppers. Now there's a job description for you. Um, to go get these people what they wanted. You know, they're doing clothes and makeup. It's, it's kind of outrageous in a sense. But in another sense, they said, this is what these two people need. I care about them a lot. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I know what they need. So I will do something out of the box to show that I, I understand them. I care about them. I'm supporting them. If it means that you, when, when the season's busy in accounting, you bring them a gigantic plate, plate of fudge, then you bring them a giant plate of fudge. I've discovered that works on our accounting department. <laughs> they like that. <laughs> um, fine, do the thing they need, 
to show them that not only are you're not just someone benefiting from them and they're just kind of the stepping stones you're climbing up on. No, this is a team. Mm -hmm. And as they're having their struggles, you're going to step in and help them as much as you're asking them to help you. Right. So. We do have a question from sure. one of our listeners today, and it's on mentors. So just going back to sure. that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and the, so here's the question. Uh, where did you find, where do you find your most influential mentor and how did you encourage that mentorship? Ooh. So a personal question for you. Yeah. I've had different mentors at different times in my, in my life. Um, probably the first one, and this sounds really incredibly cheesy, but I'd say my dad. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize he was a mentor until after I moved out, and I realized how much I missed that. I think that's what happens with um, kids. <laughs> um, you don't realize how valuable it is until it's gone, yeah. as it were. Um, so if my mom and dad are watching, thank you. Um, but uh, whatever that happens you to be. Send them this video sure, afterwards. we'll do that. We'll do that. <laughs> I, I do believe my mom was trying to watch. We'll see if she figured out the pieces. But, <laughs> Um, but as I've gone forward, it, maybe it's at college and you find a particular professor. Um, I, I had one where I was attending college as married, which married attending college is a little different, although it's becoming more common nowadays than most of my peers. And I had one professor where I went to him and I'm like, I'm sorry, I have been traveling on the road for work. I was working full time, attending class. I do not have time to get this assignment in by Friday. Can I please turn it in later? He's like, when's the last time you had dinner out with your wife? I'm like, mm, October. You know, it's like, you know, and this was November at this point. He's like, okay. How about we delay the assignment till Monday? Go have dinner out with your wife. You, sir, I want to learn from. <laughs> and there was this, this moment where I saw them demonstrate an aspect of, I want to be like that. And so then I went and followed that person and said, okay, can I just randomly stop in your office and ask you questions? Can you give me feedback on pieces mm -hmm. as you see me? And so w w there usually was a moment where I saw something I wanted and they were able to identify so they understood the terms of that relationship. I'm looking for help in how do I prioritize? In his case, it was prioritization. I wanted to learn how you do that because he looked in, at my life, said you were obviously out of prioritization. Let me fix it for you. Mm -hmm. Oh. Let, let, how do I learn more about that? <laughs> so then I went and followed up on that. It might mean that it's someone who is a mentor when it comes to um, philosophy or, or um, it could be theology, maybe something in church. It might be something that you do with a local a civics group or someone who's gone a little further down the road. Or it might mean you find someone, this is, this is usually the best one, who's the furthest along, uh, the, the, someone you interact with that's further down the road than you are in some aspect, that has expressed a definitive care for you. Okay, I find this is how I end up mentoring people, not so much how I find mentors always, but how I end up doing a lot of mentoring myself, is when someone says, okay, can you please keep teaching me stuff? As a rule, for someone who's a little older, that is a high compliment. It's also a little terrifying, but it's a high compliment. And most people, I've found, say yes. It's just they're not asked very often. Um, and, a lot of, and so that, that asking usually is, is the best piece of it. And what, where I work right now, um, for my superiors and my colleagues, I have identified three different people that I have, I have as mentors. And they're in different areas. Uh, one of them is relational, okay? A and it's a, it's a friend of mine who's not above me or below me in rank, it's just separate outside the field, who allows me to vent when I'm stressing out and allows me to have good, solid, measured responses by letting me process through the emotions of it until we start dealing with the, 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 kind of the, the actual issues of it. That's crucial. And he's taught me how to do that in the rest of life. Now, not to say I do it perfectly. My love, if you're watching, you know that. But <laughs> nonetheless, that happens. But he does it in that area. Maybe someone else is teaching me, is mentoring me on an organizational level. Here's how an organization can work. Here's how it shouldn't work. Here's how we're doing it, and it's not how it should work. And you learn that process and explain it so that as you're building your piece, you learn those lessons going forward. So maybe you'll get an organization, a mentor in a professional way. Um, and that's often within your, your career area or your area of service, whatever that happens to be. Um, that's, that's a long answer to a question that was looking for something more <laughs> specific, but I, I don't have a, a way to do that maybe as well as I'd like to. I, I think it draws out a point that you can have more than one mentor in life. You'll don't need one. Just, yeah, exactly. Like If you try and go through life with one person teaching you, know, I think you're probably going to, A, only get one perspective, and yes. B, that person's going to get a little sick of you. Um, yes, <laughs> yes. And the third thing I think you'd be, have to be careful about is understanding that if we understand that we are imperfect, mm -hmm. that we don't have it all together all the time. As much as we'd like everyone on a resume that looks at a resume to believe that we've got it all together all the time, we don't. And sometimes we utterly spaz out, throw our hands up in the air, run around like a chicken. Um, not on camera, preferably. <laughs> but as much as we understand that happens, understand your mentors do too. Mm -hmm. They are 
they have just as many challenges as you do. They might be different challenges, and they may have figured out some stuff you're wrestling with, and they now have new things. So if you're limiting yourself to one person, you're only going to get them and, the, and essentially also their mess. So having that broad spectrum of input, that, that multitude of counselors, is your betterment. Um, you can have one powerful mentor. That's great. Mm -hmm. But completely isolating yourself to one, I would actually generally counsel against. I think it actually makes it worse than mm -hmm. better. Great. All righty. Last piece. And I think we're running out of time, so I'll have to be uh, direct about it. When you are a leader, at the end of the day, it comes down to a question of trust. We've alluded to this several times over the show, and, and you, you, you grabbed it right. Um, I believe it was uh, one of the Blackabees uh, has a, a book on leadership, and they talk about how the currency of leadership is trust. If we are in leadership, and we ask someone to do something, and we don't explain why, and they do it, we are burning or gaining trust. So for example, if I ask you to do something that makes no sense to you, okay, and I do it, or, and you do it, and then it works, like it achieves the end that you didn't think it could, you just went, oh, he knows something, he learned something, he had some insight. So the next time I ask you to do the crazy thing, you're like, okay, I've earned some of your trust here. Or maybe I ask you to do something crazy, and you're like, I don't understand. That makes no sense. Why on earth would we use do that event or these colors or that thing or have these people do that, whatever that is? And I, as the leader, step down and say, okay, well, let me explain why. And I give you that explanation. And you're like, oh, and then it works. You see it. Mm -hmm. I've built trust. I'm, I'm building into my team. Okay? And sometimes I'll, have, I'll be flying down the hallway. We talked about this earlier. Sometimes you just come blast past. I need the thing. <laughs> and you're running down the hallway and you don't even have time for a please. Yeah. But your staff know that you are asking, you're asking, and they, you know, they know that if you have an issue, you can come back to them. And they know that as a rule, when you ask for the crazy thing, there's a good reason and it will work. You've built trust. Now sometimes, if you ask for the crazy thing, um, they will burn trust, for lack of better terms. They will say, okay, I don't get it, I don't think it makes any sense, but very well, he's asked, I'll do it. Okay. And all of leadership life is that earning and occasionally spending of trust. You know, you don't want to spend it um, in, a, in a crazy or a shameless manner, but often you can say, okay, people, I don't have time to explain. I need these three things. I need it by three. Go. And everyone's sprinting, and they don't know why they're doing the pieces they're doing, but they trust you. You're burning a bit of trust, and then you earn that back because they see what the end result it was. But if, you don't if they don't trust you to start with, you're not going to get anything done. You're, if your team doesn't trust you, you're toast. And if you don't trust your team, that delegation thing kicks back in. But as it also means as a leader, we must constantly consider the fact that when we're asking for things to and from our team, our core people, or our larger audience, we are either earning their trust or occasionally spending it. And we want to be earning it. Um, we want to be doing things that is going to build that relationship so the next time we ask them for the larger thing, they're like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I don't know why, but I'll do that. And those, that, that's where you see the, the greatest impact. Um, and that, that's crucial to it. So. Um, uh, to use a almost religious term, this is an idea of a servant leader, someone who's serving others, and that explaining process goes into it, mm -hmm. and that builds the trust in that leader. So, as a young leader, I, this is something I wish I would have learned a long time ago. <laughs> Had to learn it's, it the hard way. Yeah, it's definitely something that, that I think a lot of people could use from a very early age, learn those experiences, and then when, by the time they're ready to go be a real leader, a real life leader, Rather than learning it on the job, we're reading, yeah, on the fly, yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit. It, it's downright painful, but it is crucial. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, it's it's why I do what I do, and it's something <laughs> I absolutely love to do. So. Yeah. Before we close out, I just want to ask: Is anybody in the audience have any questions before we move on? We are running short on time, but oh. Oh, we may have one. Hi, I'm Ethan, and I'm from Winchester, Virginia, and I want to go back to the topic of mentoring really quick. Sure. I'm currently in a position in my life where I may have the opportunity to mentor someone. Ah. What would you suggest, what would the best we, uh, hmm, what would be the best way to go about mentoring someone? Let me give you two or three real practical answers to that, and there are some philosophical answers that I don't have time for, but the practical one? <laughs> Um, a little bit of programming to your mentoring is not a bad thing. We're going to meet once every other week. Have some sort of schedule. It provides some predictability, some consistency, and if someone asks someone to do something else, they know when it's due by. Okay? Um, it also means if you're going to be doing the mentoring, be upfront with what you don't know. If, so, if they ask you something, just because you're the mentor, it does not mean, mean you need to have God's own knowledge. Okay? You don't, so don't present that you do. <laughs> um, none of us do, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, lastly, 
occasionally you'll find yourself in a position where you don't know the answer, but you think you can learn it. It is not a bad thing as a, as a mentor to occasionally say, okay, I don't know that either. Let's learn it together. Because it, some of the most powerful mentoring I've been involved in is not just when someone's expounding their wisdom to you. It's when life happens on life and you figure it out together going forward and you not only learn the answer to your question, but you learn how to learn the answer to the question. And that's done in, by, by working together. And that is an incredibly powerful element of, of mentoring. That's why I recommend it as a type of, uh, type of learning if you could at <laughs> all do it. So there we go. Hope that helps. Great answer. Great question. Thank Last you. one more question. All right. Hi, Joel. I'm from I'm Elizabeth, and I'm from Percival. And I was just wondering if you had um, any people that you look at as models of good leadership. You've talked about your dad and sure. a few other people in your life, but do you have any other people that you kind of look at and say, oh, they modeled it this way? Ah, uh, I, I have plenty of historical models. I'm something of a history snob. Um, and, so, and my favorite, I, I think my favorite places in history are usually places where history is in crisis. Mm. Um, that tends to be where leaders show up. Um, if it means you're seeing that in 9-11 or you're seeing it in World War II, you see leaders step to the fore. And, and because frankly, leaders are often what people are looking for when everything goes to heck. Okay, yeah. It's like, now it's on fire. Now I need someone <laughs> to get me out. Whereas before I didn't care and now we're paying the consequences for it. You know, it's when, it's when it goes horribly wrong. If it's, uh, Winston Churchill's an, a favorite of mine for many reasons. Um, and a, not an unknown quantity in this room by any stretch of the imagination. But there's dozens of places where he has leadership that he is put in a position to make hard decisions. And he, he talks about how it is and, and how it's done. And I mean, his, bio, his autobiographies are amazing. Read those. But uh, that would be an example. Um, as a more recent one, uh, one of the things I found fascinating is actually um, George W. Bush Jr., um, his decision points memoir of just how he had to wrestle with those decisions and wrestling through it, a powerful look at leadership um, in, in crisis, as it were. Uh, and, and not to say he'll always make the perfect answer, and a uh, perfect decision, he'll say as much. Mm -hmm. Um, he, he, you go down to the presidential library in Dallas and he talks about that and he actually has a what they call it I think it's a decision points theater you get to go in and actually walk through the decisions he made in a real time pressure set setting and it's, it's a great way to learn how, to, how, that, how hard that is um, but I admire him for the decisions that he had to make and not always agreeing with them but understanding that's hard mm -hmm. um, those are contemporaries um, there's uh, plenty of people that would be in ministry and nonprofit. There are people that I work with uh, personally, but uh, as far as well known ones, if you want to study leaders, those are two good mm -hmm. ones. Yeah. So. Great. Okay. Well, Joel, we only had an hour today. Of course. There's a lot more we could have talked about. Quite a bit. How, where, how can I learn more about what you do and okay. what you're talking about today? Well, if you're looking, if you're interested in, in young people or helping young people become leaders, uh, which we could probably use a few more good ones. <laughs> um, Generation Joshua is the organization that I'm the director of. And you can go to the website, generationjoshua.org, um, all one word put together. And there's information on both how we do things on a local level, on a federal level, the summer camp simulations I talked about, even um, opportunities for students to be involved in political operations in the fall, uh, coming up very soon now, um, and how to learn these processes, again, by doing. Mm -hmm. Because as we mentioned, the purpose, how to learn leadership is best done practically um, by doing it and practicing it. And so everything we do at Generation Joshua is designed to allow young leaders a chance to practice their mm -hmm. craft. And so that's what we do all around yep. the country. And what was the website again? Generationjoshua.org. Perfect. Well, thank you again for joining us. This was an excellent discussion. It's and been a pleasure. I think everyone at home and here enjoyed it as much as I did. So thank you again. Uh, and thank you all at home for tuning in today. Uh, as always, this broadcast was recorded and will be online for your viewing later uh, and you can do that by going to you can see it when, when it's online you can see it at leadershipinstitute.org slash activism on demand where this video will be and all of our previous ones so uh, if you're new you can go check out some of the old ones uh, with that our next webinar is on uh, is coming up in two weeks on Wednesday uh, October 12th and unlike most broadcasts, this one's going to be at 11 a.m. Um, to uh, accommodate our guest, where we will be talking about Facebook Live. So it'll be a good one to tune into uh, if you are at all interested in Facebook Live. So hope to see you then, and have a good night.